Okay, we are now live. All right, welcome everybody. This is um, Tuesday, May 26th, and we are the House General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Today's agenda will include further conversations on the housing proposal that was um, made by the administration and what our response would be or how we would fill that in. Um, but we were also um, interested in hearing from AHS, DCF, OEO, um, just basically overall from, uh, we have Sean Brown with us today, who will take us through, um, who will take us through, I believe, uh, Ken Schatz's, Commissioner Schatz's memorandum of just sort of lays out the plan. But again, Sean, welcome. Um, we've seen just about everybody else but you. Uh, <laughs> Good morning. In, in, in committee uh, since March. And, um, you know, one of the things that stood out in the governor's proposal was that it, um, at least as it had to do with housing, it was talking about homelessness prevention with the rental uh, assistance programs or REARCH programs and, and then provision of you know, some funding to try to rehabilitate some apartments that could be used for housing the homeless in the, in the near future. But what was missing was your piece, which was the uh, transition from where we are uh, having housed the upwards of 2,000 Vermonters on a temporary basis and what the transition will be, not only because the weather's um, turned, but also because of, you know, we're still under a stay at home, um, real safety oriented circumstance here with COVID-19. And so we just wanted to get an update on what was happening at AHS, what the thoughts were, what the plans were, funding. Um, is this still gonna be funding that comes from FEMA or ESG or other sources? Um, so we just wanted to get an update from you and, and get an idea of what the state is doing to work on what I would consider the shortest of short-term situations, which is how to take people from, from these um, motel rooms which have served their purpose, there's no doubt, but uh, we all know is no full-time or long-term um, solution to, to what we're facing. Um, so with that, I will, I will um, pass the microphone to you, welcome. Oh, thank you. Good morning to, uh, to the committee. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Commissioner Schatz sends his regrets. He's unexpectedly out today, um, so he won't be able to join in the conversation, but he does send his regrets. <clears throat> um, we do continue um, to house a large number of homeless um, households in motels in response to the pandemic. Um, we're just shy of 1,500 households, still um, uh, just over 2,000. Um, uh, individuals, about 1,700 adults, and about just over 300 children as well. Um, um, we are working um, on a transition plan to, to move um, forward um, and as a recovery plan. Um, we continue to do that work. It's complicated um, by the different revenue streams that might be available and the different limitations um, that come with those funding streams. So that is complicating the work and the conversations we're having on how to move forward um, within the timeframes and the funding that we have available. We do hope to have a, um, a plan available in the coming weeks to share. Um, what we do know is that a, a large part of that plan will, will require services from our community partners for navigation and case management. Um, and through the HOP program, Housing Opportunity Program grants, I'm starting to issue out some supplemental awards to um, homeless providers across the state over the last couple of weeks to start um, providing additional resources to support the, uh, the housing work that they're doing right now in the motels, but also the work that's gonna be needed um, to transition folks to more permanent housing from motels in the coming months. Um, and you will see us, um, issuing more of those out in the coming weeks as well. We want to um, provide um, funding to all of our partners that work with us so that we can um, serve the large number of households that we have um, in motels right now. Um, and uh, to kind of switching from the response phase of the pandemic to the recovery phase as we finalize the details of that longer term plan. Um, you know, we are looking at 
um, implementing some of the program rules back into place that pre-existed um, the pandemic um, as we will continue to house homeless families due to the pandemic, but we are gonna start easing in some of the, the program require, require requirements that um, pre-existed as well. That was in, those were outlined in the memo that was sent out this morning um, under Commissioner Schatz's signature. Um, one is you'll see that um, beginning June 1st, um, we're gonna work to increase uh, the, you know, the resources available to our partners to do this work, the navigation, the case management. We've issued some funding out already and we hope to issue more in the coming days. Um, we're gonna uh, require that the households we're serving um, cooperate with a coordinated entry in the development of a longer term housing plan. Um, what we do know from um, looking at the number of households we're serving, they're quite different and they have very unique needs and each plan needs to be individualized. Um, and so that work will need to take into account their unique circumstances and the path forward and how we support that. Um, also, um, you know, we've been having some challenges in the motels and losing some motels working with us um, as um, due to some of the um, uh, situations happening in the motels across the state right now. And we will be looking to um, implement um, a modified period of ineligibility for those who are asked to leave a motel due to their um, conduct. And so we'll be um, issuing more details on that in, in the coming days as well. And then also, um, given um, that the whole system of care uh, shut down when the pandemic started um, and anyone who's homeless um, was housed, um, um, you know, we opened the program up uh, pretty significantly. Um, one of the things we'll be looking at um, imp implementing effective June 15th, will be having households once again contribute some of their resources to housing above the, if they're above the reach up standard. Um, and that's usually a 30% contribution. We're housing a large number of folks with some, with some ongoing monthly income. Um, and so we want those households to start making contributions and hopefully that'll allow us to move them to more permanent housing situations as we ask them to um, utilize some of their resources for this work as well. Um, and we'll be providing more information as, as these details get finalized in the coming days. But we wanted to make sure the committee was aware as we're shifting to the recovery phase one component of that, as we're trying to transition folks and provide those resources to move them to more permanent um, housing that we are gonna start easing in some of the program requirements. Um, that's not to say that we're not going to continue to house um, families and, re and individuals in response to COVID. We have no plans to, to, um, uh, to change that approach. Um, we have changed how we're um, granting authorizations. We were doing it for 30-day periods of time. We are now doing it for two-week periods of time, and we will continue to do that um, for the foreseeable future. So we are in the process of reauthorizing everyone's um, um, motel and hotel stays that run out at the end of this week. So they'll be rehoused through the 15th. Um, and then we will then uh, reauthorize for another two week period after that as well. Um, there's multiple reasons we're doing that. One as we're moving to a recovery phase, we wanna make sure we're, we're staying in touch with our families more often. Um, these reauthorizations do require us to reach out and have contact with, with our, the households we're serving. And, um, and as we're moving forward with um, wanting them to work on a housing plan that'll allow us to stay in touch with them and monitor that progress. Also, um, some of the hotels we're working with that ask that we um, do these on shorter stays, some of it has to do with the way that the billing process works and uh, allows them to bill quicker. And, um, get, and get paid quicker than the 30-day authorization. So there's a multitude of reasons, um, but uh, none of which implicate us winding it down. We saw um, in preparing for the committee that there was a date of July 15th. Uh, we're not sure where, that's, where that came from, but there's been no internal conversation about um, shutting the program down on July 15th. So we can assure the committee that that's not something we're looking to do at this time. So. Um, I would say the other thing, uh, piece I would add is that we still are um, have in place a uh, feeding operation to make sure all of the households in the motels 
um, have access to food. And so we're um, contracting with the food services across the state to, to make sure that, that um, those uh, contracts and work is in place as we continue to uh, use this in response to the pandemic and making sure that um, people are able to stay safe and uh, have access to nutritious food in the, in, uh, at the same time. And so we will continue both of those in conjunction as, as long as needed at this point as we um, finalize the details and hopefully start moving some of these households to more permanent housing um, situations as, as uh, Vermont starts to reopen and we have access to some of those normal resources that are available to do that work. Okay, and uh, Sean, do you have, um, several weeks ago we received a um, list of where folks were, the hotels yes. that were participating. Is there an updated list that's available? Or yes, is I, can forward, I can forward that to the committee right after um, we finish up the testimony. Yeah, that would be great. And so, and and we've heard um, uh, a number of times, and most recently from Sarah Phillips, that um, there's been a real concerted effort to get people into the coordinated entry system. And if you could just give me a couple of minutes of just to remind me of what that system is, how does how does someone get into it, and and hopefully what the benefits of that are going to be? Yeah, uh, coordinated entry is a system of uh, intake um, where homeless individuals uh, work with the uh, the housing partners participating in coordinated entry. So everyone coming into the homeless system of care in Vermont is connected with a coordinated entry partner. And they do a, um, an assessment of those families' circumstances and needs. And then um, that information is placed into the homeless management information system known as HMIS. And then any homeless provider working with that family um, when they, with the appropriate releases have access to that information so that, um, as I indicated before, every family has very unique needs and those are kind of detailed in that coordinated entry assessment. And so as housing plans are developed and implemented for that household, you know, that information informs that decision making and path forward. Okay, and is that, is that, um... So that would that would kind of take into account what Commissioner Schatz testified to several weeks ago, where there's X percentage of people are episodically homeless, X percentage of people require the next level up from services, and the next level of uh, the next percentage of people are perhaps the, some of the most difficult. They have numerous challenges to to being um, uh, finding a place, a stable place to live. Is that, that's, I mean, to me, that's the goal of this, this entry system is to be aware of what their needs are so that we can funnel them to the right solution. Is that, is that the, like the best case scenario? Yes, that is, that is our hope and our goal is that, that we would use that information to, to help um, um, find appropriate housing for all the different levels of need that we see of the families and households we're serving. You know, it's as I indicated, each family has very unique needs. And so having the ability to understand um, the complex needs of some of these families, whether they be substance abuse, mental health, um, maybe um, financial, um, managing their finances. I mean, across the board, the needs are, are can be pretty complex and interwoven. And so it's important that um, we understand the needs of those families as we try to uh, develop a plan that that we can support to move them to more permanent housing. Okay, um, I have several questions here ready to ready to go. Representative Triano, then Hango, then Walls. And that, if I could just add on to the, to this conversation in response to your question, um, given the response and how quickly we moved and and opened up the system to make sure all homeless individuals could stay home and stay safe in a motel, um, it it overwhelmed the system in a way. And so that um, some of this work wasn't able to get done on the front end. And so that's what we're trying to implement now is to make sure that we're connecting to all of these households and making sure um, we're, we're working with them and, and moving them forward. Great, thank you. Representative Triano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
thank you, Sean. It's good to see you again here, and uh, your information is reliable as always. So, but I do have a question. There's been a fair amount of discussion, or or at least information around some of the issues and problems that they there have been that have been have arisen, uh, particularly I guess at the Mountain View or Mountainside uh, Motel. Um, I guess my question is simple: Is has the department been able to deal with these issues in a uh, in a good way and resolve issues that have come up, and and will uh, support services that we anticipate uh, accompanying some of these uh, uh, per more permanent housing uh, accommodate some of these issues? Do you think? Yeah. So in the short term, we have worked um, with community providers. Um, particularly in motels that, that um, are housing large number of, of GA um, guests, that we are able to provide some on-site services um, to, to help support um, those folks that are staying in those motels. Um, you know, it's also the work that we're doing right now. Um, we've um, repurposed the Holiday Inn once again. You know, it was initially used as, as, a, mo as a hotel, then it went to Recovery Center, um, and now, um, starting last Friday, we started utilizing that, but it's a, it's kind of a hybrid model now where, um, while it is a hotel, we have, um, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity providing 24 seven staffing on site, um, uh, some additional, um, security resources as well. Um, and so we're going to, that, that's a model that we're going to, um, move forward within the Holiday Inn. And then hopefully by having those resources on site that we can connect with those households um, quicker and then hopefully start working on longer term housing plans with them and provide the so supports necessary to move those plans forward. Um, some of the families, um, you know, it, it's stressful in itself, um, it, you know, adjusting to the pandemic, but it's even incredibly stressful when you're homeless and staying in a motel, which uh, comes with its own challenges. Thank you. And Sean, will those families be, again, in that list of, of folks, are they identified um, beyond just households? Do we know where, I guess, do we know where the children are? Uh, yes, we, um, on the list that we'll provide you, um, it's by district and it will uh, list all the motels that are serving uh, households from that district, um, the number of households and then the number of adults and the number of children at each hotel. So you'll be able to see that in the list we'll provide you. Great, thank you. Representative mm -hmm. Henko. Thank you, good morning. Um, I have a very specific question that's coming from some constituents in my area and it's um, around feeding. Um, it's the EBT cards that are being automatically given to each family with children in schools. Um, and the schools are the ones, the ones in question are the families at schools where all of the children qualify for reduced and free lunch because such a majority of the students in that school qualify. And there are a number of families who would not ordinarily qualify, do not want to qualify, but are still receiving these benefits and don't wish to receive them. Mm -hmm. I reached out through our legislative portal to get an answer from the administration and we were told to tell the constituents just to cut the cards up, don't use them, the money will go back to the coffers. And my concern was that the, the sentence that came with that explaining it is, Please tell these families, don't be afraid. The money isn't, if they use the cards, the money's not being taken from somebody else. But the money really is being taken from a greater pool of money that we all could use for further economic relief. And my concern and their, my constituents' concerns were that this money is being given to people in the form of EBT cards that they don't want and some of them may be using them unnecessarily. So, um, you know, in, in, in respect to possible waste in that matter, I needed to bring this up with you. Sure, I uh, certainly understand the question. Um, yeah, so the, the, those benefits uh, were created by one of the um, recent federal stimulus um, acts that, uh, in the US Congress. Um, 
it's referred to as the P pandemic EBT uh, benefit. Okay. Um, it, yep, and so this money does not come directly to Vermont. Um, it is money that uh, comes through the USDA through the Food Nutrition Service. Um, and we are required um, to provide that benefit to all children who receive free and reduced lunch, irregardless if if they um, are participating in the Three Squares Vermont program or not. We um, Vermont did not have a choice. If we chose to issue this benefit out, we had to issue it to all families who have children that receive free and reduced lunch. And because of the community provision that you referenced, there are families who. Um, didn't apply um, for uh, free and reduced lunch, but whose children receive it as a result of that, that community has such a high level mm -hmm. of participation in the free and reduced that they're able to provide it to, to all children. Um, and we were required to provide that benefit to those households as well. Um, it is certainly um, a choice of those households whether to utilize that benefit or not. And ultimately under the EBT card rules, um, if a, if a, a benefit's not used in a certain amount of time, it is taken back um, by the federal government. Uh, those dollars don't flow through the state of Vermont. They are provided. We um, tell the USDA of uh, uh, the households who receive what benefit, um, and they provide the funds to our EBT card vendor to put those on into the bank they use. Um, and then it would be taken off those cards that way as well. Um, but that just to give you background of why those benefits were provided. And it is not taking um, uh, any stimulus money away from the state of Vermont. This is money that didn't flow through the state of Vermont or, or uh, its uh, treasurer's office. Thank you very much for clarifying that. I, I truly appreciate that. And I will pass it on to people in my community who are, are talking about this. Thank you so much. Representative Walls. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us here this morning, Sean. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, looking at the uh, people income and uh, getting them to put some skin in the game, actually. And I think that's appropriate. But I, I do wonder what qualifies as income, I'm especially thinking of maybe those episodic homeless folks who lost their jobs and were homeless as a result and maybe receiving uh, unemployment insurance benefits. Those, do those benefits, are they the kind of income you're talking about? Yeah, it, it would be um, many just, different sources like, of income. It could, be, of income. It, it could be a VA bet, uh, ongoing monthly VA bet, uh, benefits. It could be social security uh, benefits, social security disability benefits, unemployment, or, or earned income or any ongoing unearned income like from investments or whatnot. It really is across the board and income is a broad term. Well, thank you. That really, that really clarifies it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sean, we, I received a note from the folks at Pathways who mentioned that in the last several weeks they have housed 40, upwards of 40 households. Um, and again, households is a fairly broad term, right? It could be an individual, it could be a, a pair of people, it could be a family. But um, beyond pathways, there are other there are other agencies that. who do have an income, for instance. I mean, as you begin to identify people who have an income and you're gonna be asking that they that they put in 30%. Um, I'm, you... I'm, I'm sorry, you cut out for a large portion of your question. Oh. I was wondering if you could repeat it. Sure, sorry. It looks like I've, <laughs> my, my internet connection was unstable. Um, so basically, how are you working with the, path, the Pathways um, or with people who are doing Housing First programs, not only Pathways, but um, an agency like Washington, Mental Ca Washington County Mental Health or other agencies across the state that have a program. And Pathways mentioned that they may have, you know, that they've um, housed upwards of 40 people so far since March. 
Yes, and they've actually sent us a proposal to expand their work, which we're reviewing and considering um, right now. Um, normally, um, we would uh, um, work with providers that um, apply through requests for proposals through the Housing Opportunity Grant Program, and that will be the mechanism um, that we will continue to issue out a lot of the, the funding that we will allocate to the to the services in, um, in uh, the housing plan as it's rolled out. Um, so we would incur, when we do that, we will reach out to organizations um, that have expressed an interest to submit to submit proposals that haven't, or or for those that have, to work directly with those organizations to understand um, what populations they could work work with and how they would do that. Um, we expect we'll be working with all of the our housing partners, you know, regarding making sure we access every available federal housing uh, voucher that is available to Vermont right now and make sure that we have, um, you know, what's been a, a roadblock in, in fully utilizing those in the past uh, or having the services in place. And that's why it's um, incredibly important that we um, um, support expanding our navigation and case management um, services as quickly as possible in the coming month or coming months to make sure that we can support not only um, you know implementing our longer term housing plan but also um, uh, making sure that we can support drawing down all the federal vouchers that we have available to Vermont as well and make sure that families that are eligible for those can take advantage of those as well because as, as you know many of those are a longer term support um, and that will be there for longer than some of the funding that we will have available to support the plan that we're working on right now. I think that's gonna be very important to, to get a list of as well, because as we develop a recovery or relief fund through, I mean, I, we've heard that it, it might cost, you know, upwards of X million dollars to provide the Vermont state vouchers from the, you know, managed through the state housing authority, mm -hmm. but, certainly more effective would be increased vouchers from the federal government, whether they're um, tag along vouchers or project based. And it sounds yeah, like, and, I mean, yeah, and, and we've been working with our partners who administer those and understanding that they did receive some additional ones through some of the increased federal spending through the stimulus bills. And so um, we're working with them to identify that, you know, the households that those um, specialize in um, and making sure that we can, um, um, support the services to connect the families that we're serving right now um, and line them up with what they have available. And that will be a part of uh, our work as well moving forward. And that includes, if I did, if I heard you correctly, that's going to include what the ideal is, right? Is the, not only, not only a voucher, but also the wraparound services that a housing first type model needs in order to in in order to succeed exactly and so we have um you know we we do have uh you know the covid relief fund available uh, to support some of our work um unfortunately those are time limited dollars and those have to be spent by december 30th um, and so part of our work right now is identifying what resources can be repurposed and used to support this work or dollar or new dollars we'd receive that might have a longer runway to be spent past December to make sure that um, um, you know we can support um, the longer term work that's going to be necessary to um, to connect those families to those vouchers, but make sure they're successful in whatever situation and maintain those vouchers um, moving forward as well. In addition to uh, the other work that we hope to do in in our longer term housing plan that we're finalizing. No, the, the December 30th thing is a, is a real problem when it comes to the provision of services. Um, mm -hmm. it, in committee, I think if you've noticed that Wendy Morgan has joined us and we'll get to her in a little while to talk about the um, proposal of $42 million of rental assistance and arrearages and what that means, but also you know that it is money that would be ha have to be spent before the end of the year. Um, it's a tough balance, and I think Sean, you, you kind of put it into. Um, I appreciate you coming at it from the services perspective, but because we have housing proposals that we have to consider, that will only be successful if there are service provisions as well. 
and whether that's a, you know, how do we guarantee that the state will follow through mm-hmm. on the, I mean, that's been, I mean, that's the age old problem is, is making sure that there's enough capacity um, to provide the services for the, for the other, for the needs, for the vouchers that we might have or for the apartments that we may create. Um, we have a question from Representative Triano. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering, Sean, we're seeing or we're we hearing about uh, funding for rehabbing for to landlords to for grants or loans to rehab the vacant apartments. Um, of course, they won't accommodate uh, the 2,000 uh, homeless Vermonters at this time, but I'm wondering if there's a consideration in your department as to how that transition might work. I mean, would it, the plan be to keep folks in the motel until some of these units are are ready for uh, habitation or um, is there something else that we're looking at? Well, those are the conversations we're having right now with Josh uh-huh. through ACCD um, to understand um, their time frame and how they're going to administer those funds. And, um, and, and um, certainly would be our preference to any new apartments that come online uh, quickly would be hopefully be that we would be able to uh, get in line first for the families that we're serving in motels and move them out as quickly as possible. Uh, but those are the conversations that are happening right now. Great. That would be our preference, I think, as a committee as well, that, uh, that uh, priorities go to folks that are presently um, housed. Yeah, both of those proposals will uh, 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 help our work incredibly. Uh, the rental assistance, you know, the um, you know, home, uh, prevention of homelessness um, is key. We make sure we uh, prevent new families and, in, and households from becoming homeless. But then also, um, as you know, um, you know, we have a tight housing market, and and particularly for affordable units. And so, um, that eight million dollars will go a long ways to bring some new units on that make them, afford, you know, accessible to the families we're serving. Hopefully, great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Sean, on the rental assistance, um, there's been a, just a certain amount in the HOP program, um, in the HOP funding for rental rearages, and we, we've taken testimony from legal aid on, on the success of the program, at least in, in Franklin County, in particular in Franklin County. But having eight or nine hundred thousand dollars in a in a rental arrearage fund is far different than having forty two million dollars in a in a rental assistance fund. And I know that that would be split up between arrearages, you know, and potential um, state based vouchers. And 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 I know there's, that that's kind of the work that we have to do is to make some estimates on on. Um, What's the difference between rental arrears and rental assistance, and, and how it's going to work with the with the nuttiness of this crisis? But if that money were parked, I mean, would it be parked in the HOP program, or would we need to create a a new cubicle that would handle you know the the disbursement and the and the rulemaking and the you know I mean I I'm interested in trying to find a solution that includes as many programs and many as many processes that already exist um, that may have to be grown but as we've seen with the UI issue um, it, and and the homelessness issue that you described it can quickly get overwhelmed what we have right now yeah it's certainly complicated for sure um, there's no doubt about that um, my understanding in, in in our conversations is that the the program that they're setting up um, will be a, a, a distinct program um, and that it wouldn't be funneled through the HOT program, but administered through ACCD and, um, and their departments there. Um, you know, we will continue um, with our HOT funding, um, but as you indicated, it's, it'll be a small fraction of, um, um, in my sense is this, that, that um, 42 million, and you know, I, would, I, I don't have a lot of the details, is gonna work directly with many of the landlords who have not been paid, you know, and that will be the, um, one of the mechanisms that they'll identify is working directly with landlords and understanding who's who's in arrears and not um, on their rent because um, we are seeing some unprecedented economic um, conditions in the state right now. Right. No, it's um, you know designing the rules mm-hmm. will be incredibly important because again it's. It, again, that's not for AHS. I think that'll be an ACCD 
you know, conversation, but um, I think it's really important to get that right because it's, you know, the contract is between the tenant and the landlord and, and how we figure, how we figure that out is going to be um, really important. Yeah, I can tell you that we are in regular contact as they um, develop the, uh, their plan to, to utilize those funds and to implement it. And so we're in weekly contact with, um, with their staff. And so um, we're helping inform some of those um, decisions that are being made to make sure um, that it will work for some of the folks that we may um, see the need for, but also just um, so that it complements the work we do as well. So that that we're we're a lot. I just say that make sure we're aligned. So. Right. So so to go back to the beginning, um, it, we've always viewed this situation as having a short and a medium and a long term solution. Mm -hmm. And I think AHS is on the front lines of the short term solution. Obviously, mm -hmm. getting people into the motels, but also now. Get, and getting food to them, taking over programs that had been set up by other organizations and taking respond the state taking responsibility for providing um, in feeding this population. So, but to recap from what I heard is that starting on June for you're, you're gonna renew whoever has received a, 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 a voucher under extremely no barrier circumstances, unlike, mm -hmm. the, unlike the way it's been for cold weather. Mm -hmm. um, GA assistance. That's going to continue. What I heard you say is that you're going to change the process from 30 day voucher to a 14 day voucher. Yes. Um, internally, that should help pay the motels a little bit faster. Allow us to be in touch with our families a little more regularly as well. That they have to come to you every two weeks to get yeah. to tell you whether they still need the voucher or not. Yeah, and just to see where they're at with their work. It'll be a phone contact. It certainly won't be an in-person contact, but as most of our work is transitioned to online or telephone contact. And yeah. are you, I mean, and it sounds like that the program in the motels will go on as long, that while there will be some active work on trying to house people to transition out of motels, that there's no set deadline to that that the motels have set or the state has set that people have to be out of the motels yeah there's been no deadline set um, our hope is is that um, as we finalize the details of a longer term housing plan that that will be the roadmap forward and help help kind of map that out um, and so there's been no um, deadline set where we're saying that it this all comes to an end uh, on on x date that that's not um, a conversation we're having right now. So there we're could be people in motels. There could be people in motels on August first. There could be yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you Hopefully, a lot less if we're successful in in rolling out our longer term housing plan. That's our goal: is to transition people out as quickly as possible to more permanent housing solutions. Um, and that will look different for um, depending on the household how that rolls out. And what I heard from. Um, and what I heard from you on the Holiday Inn in South Burlington was um, it sounded like you were describing almost a Harbor Place circumstance where there, you were embedding a service um, organization, CBOEO, uh, into the hotel to provide some of the services and on site. Or maybe, I mean, I guess it's closer to what's going on perhaps at Hill, Hilltop. But um, but isn't isn't that kind of a harbor place? It set is. Up? It, I would say it's like harbor place on steroids. Um, harbor place. Um, there are services provided on site um, uh, regularly. These will be on site twenty four seven at the Holiday Inn. It will be on site uh, staffing resources on site twenty four hours a day, seven days a week um, at the Holiday Inn, which isn't the case. Um, at Harbor Place, those but also, yeah, right. But also, we're still paying the motel rate, whatever we negotiate for the motel rooms. I mean, yes, yeah, so um, and, and, that... and we've entered into a master lease with the Holiday Inn, so we're getting very favorable rates compared to the market motel rates in Chittenden County at the Holiday Inn right now, which is okay. Good. One of the reasons we've reverted back there is it allowed us to do that. And how long has that been? 
uh, that um, we started moving uh, households in on Friday. We're doing it over a, a period of four or five days um, because the service CBOEO is meeting um, and doing an, an intake and assessment with each household as they move in and they're only able to do so many a day. And so we're, we started on Friday and another group will move, be moving in today, a max of like 20 to 30 households a day will be re, uh, moving into the holiday. And how many rooms is that? Uh, they have a total of 170. Um, we're gonna stop at around 100 to 110 to just um, see how that works with the resources we have on site and then, uh, and then move forward and filling more of the rooms if, if it's working. Okay. what we have on site and for security and services at this point. Great. Um, Representative Hango, and then Byron. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I repeat myself um, every time we have someone from AHS or DCF in, but the program that um, was outlined for us by Sarah Phillips for OEO beginning um, April of 2021, where housing funding is going to be allocated to regional OEO offices mm -hmm. and the regional partners will get together to determine who best in their community to give the assistance to. Is that plan still in the works um, or have you withdrawn that? Or is that part of working with the local coordinated entry partners that you described and that Ken described in his memo? Yeah, I would say we are still interested in uh, very interested in moving forward with that proposal. I would say that um, the pandemic has certainly um, changed the dynamic around that. Um, given we were hoping to move away from motels as a model and, and move to other, um, you know, congregate setting type shelters and other service delivery models. Um, pandemic has certainly changed, um, you know, some of the approaches to that, but I think uh, we are committed to still moving forward with that proposal. I think that's what some of the conversations happening with our longer term housing plan is what, is what does the new normal look like um, for some of our shelter providers, um, you know, and how do they move forward as a model um, given this new environment we're working with. Um, and so those are the conversations we're having internally and the conversations we need to have with our partners. Um, we certainly want to move forward with it, but whether it's in April or, or a year from July 1st, we just don't know at this point what that proposal will look like, but we certainly have not taken it off the table and very much want to move forward with it still. Thank you. Representative Byron. Um, yeah, a quick question circling back to the uh, master lease you signed with the Holiday Inn. You said there was a rate differential with that. Um, what, is the, what is the rate difference per night that we have with the new agreement? Um, like like the, some of the motel, well, one of the motels we moved some folks out of on Friday um, has a rate of $129 a night. Um, my memory is this, I don't have it up in front of me and I was just looking at it on Friday, but I believe for the first 100 rooms um, at the Holiday Inn, it's $65 a night. And then any above that number go to $50 a night. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, Sean, um, changing gears a little bit, um, I appreciate all of the efforts again to, that's that we're doing in real time. You know that that we're faced with the pandemic, state of emergency, getting people into the into the um, into motel rooms, dealing with the transition. Um, do you have anybody who is in a um, uh, a planning mode for the potential of a snapback, um, where we have to reinstitute? some of the harsher conditions of, of uh, quarantining and isolation that we that we kind of have gone through, um, that we feel like we're growing out of now, but um, is, is there planning within the department? I guess scenario planning, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, I would say that those conversations and that work is, hap is happening, um, particularly 
um, with this with the shelter system of care. I think that you know we can't go. Many shelters are making decisions that um, they may not open next winter. Some of the low barrier shelters because um, they would not be able to enforce some of the social distancing that's required if there was another another wave. Or some are are um, going to open but with a reduced footprint so that they can. Um, implement that social distancing and some of the practices you need if, if there is a, a resurgence of the virus. And so those conversations are, are trying to understand what, what our capacity is going to be um, moving forward because some of it um, decisions are already being made and that we would need to be able to respond to that depending on the circumstances. Um, and certainly we've learned some lessons as, as uh, we've had to um, implement this emergency response and certainly trying to learn from those and what, what could we do better and what did we do well and how could we replicate that in the future. Um, so that's all the work that's happening behind the scenes right now to understanding how, right. some no, I just, those questions. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm, I, speaking for myself, I'm just so, I mean, that's one of the things that keeps me up is what happens when. Um, which I think we're, you know, constantly in trying to balance out um, that all our good work might change again. Uh, Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, local partners in Franklin County very much want to open a new low barrier shelter and they were poised to do so right as the crisis struck. What kind of advice for them? Is this really something that they should be going forward with? I would say um, it's 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 worth considering and moving forward if that's if that's what they want to do. I think we, um, uh, you know, are willing to provide technical expertise um, on how on how to move that project forward if that's a, what they want to do, and then work on the financial model. Um, we are always interested in expanding community investments, and that's what we would refer that to. Um, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that we are straining the motel um, capacity um, in many areas of the state, and St. Albans is in particular is one of those areas where um, we are having to move households um, out into the Chittenden County and even the Addison County area and provide transportation because of capacity issues. Um, and so anytime you can expand the services um, to serve homeless families or individuals, um, that's a good thing from our eyes. And we certainly would want to work with whatever partner is willing to step up and take on that challenge and that work. Thank you. <clears throat> right, any further questions for, for Sean right now? Um, and Sean, you're more than welcome to stick around um, I mean, there's always, there's always, I, I think in, in concert with what Representative Hango was asking about in terms of what the, you know, the program has presented um, this, this past winter about changing up the, the winter GA program. And, um, you know, we, assessing what is, how do we recreate things? How do we take an opportunity to recreate things? And, you know, on one hand, it feels like you, your division and your agency is constantly, you know, trying to work on what the new normal is. Um, and I, and I think I would just want to make sure we appreciate, let you know that we appreciate that. And, you know, given that it is some of the hardest, um, it's some of the hardest population to keep safe. It's some of the hardest funding to find, to, to make sure it's sustainable. And, um, you know, appreciate your efforts and hope that you'll stay, you or Ken or Sarah or Jeffrey or whoever you're, is on your team will keep us um, informed because the next two weeks I know we are going to be um, working, you know, on, on what a recovery package in the, in the long, short term to medium term to long term situation is going to be and we're going to be trying to tease that out. But this was important to hear that the, that this next level of transition is somewhat focused, I guess, is a good way to think about it. And um, I'm sure we'll let you know, uh, we'll have you back in in a little bit to, to make sure that that focus stays. Um, 
but I have Representative Gonzalez raising her hand with a question. It, um, thank you uh, so much. Just wanting to uh, have my refrain that I've been having during this time in terms of asking about translation services and outreach to um, to folks. And so wondering if uh, there's been any any more to report around translation services uh, and, and thinking of that that you all have been working on. Yeah, we have a, um, uh, a system in place that predated COVID in terms of making sure that um, uh, folks who, uh, who um, you know, have different ways of communicating um, have the ability to um, access our services um, as, as anyone would, um, and those continue to be available. Um, whether it's language or, or cognitive interpreter services, we, um, um, it's very important that we maintain and make sure everyone's aware of those and has access to those to make sure that um, everyone has the ability to avail themselves of all of the services that we provide, whether it's reach up, uh, lie heat fuel assistance, um, GA um, um, program um, and or Three Squares Vermont. Those are vitally important services to all Vermonters. And it's important that everyone be able to access them, um, you know, in the, in the language that they use. And so we continue to make sure that we provide those services to Vermonters. Thank you. 